So one of the things I do every quarter is I pick one word, one word, and I just obsess myself over this word and I just want to study it. It doesn't matter what it is. I order every single book about it. I watch videos on it. I study movies, documentaries on one word. Many, many years ago, I got obsessed with the word leadership because there's certain people that I am gravitated towards. You know, you got certain people in your life that are like, man, I don't know what it is about this person, but I'm turned on by them. I'm turned on by the way they think. They move me. They just do something to me that others haven't done. What makes this person be the way they are? And there's, there's maybe different styles. So what is it? So today, I'm going to take three authors, okay, three authors, who they describe different styles of super bosses or leadership styles, or whatever it is, I'm going to explain to you their different points on what different styles they see. But when you look at it a lot of times, like myself, I look at these styles and I say, okay, so why is it that this guy still made it and he's so different than this girl? But they both made it. I want to know what's in common there, not the different styles. That's what I'm going to talk to you about today with seven different styles of super boss entrepreneurs. My specific topic will be business. But the way they're talking about it is not necessarily business. It could be in any area you're a part of. So let me get right into it. Before I get into it, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, be sure to subscribe to the channel here. Click on the button. Our goal is to get to a million subscribers by the end of the year. It's a lofty goal, but we're optimistic about some of the things we're going to be presenting. So help us get to a million subs by clicking on the subscribe button here. Anything I cover, questions, thoughts, comments, comment on the bottom as well. So let's go to the first book here. This book is called Super Bosses. It's written by Sidney Finkelstein. Luis, why don't we put the image up there so everybody knows what this book looks like. It's a good book. I don't know if it's a great book, but it is a good book. He breaks down the d three different types of bosses as one, the glorious bastard, which is the guy that just pushes everybody's button, just has, is never happy, nothing ever makes him happy, nothing is ever enough, but he wins. He puts Larry Ellison in that category and puts a lot of different people in that category. The second one is the nurturer. Nurturer is the one that says, I believe in you. I think you can do it. You're so amazing. I love you. You just make me feel so good. I think you're going to make such a big difference in people's lives. And he says people such as Mary Kay, who, you know, she had a company and she did very well. Says that she falls into the category of nurture, right? And then the third one is icon. The word he uses is iconoclast. Did I say it right? So Icon. These are people that are so creative that when you work with them, you're like, my gosh, this is a creative mind. Like, what is, I'm so fascinated by this mind that this person keeps going and going and going and going and going. I'm so fascinated by, it could be art, Hollywood, creativity, music. They're mainly, their brain is just so fascinating that you, they may be difficult, they may be annoying, they may be different, they may be eccentric, they may be expecting a lot from you, but they just have this it factor that gravitates you towards them, right? So he explains them in those three different categories. I'm going to come back to it here because I'll make a point to you at the end what I mean by this. So these are here's three different descriptions on who ends up becoming a super boss that people like to work to or at least they're attracted to. Over here, Daniel Goleman, he wrote a book called Social Intelligence. Did very well if you go on Amazon. I think it's got 900 reviews. Good book. He's a psychologist, professor. I think he went to Harvard. Pretty educated guy, credible guy. Uh, he's written some, I think he wrote a book called Primal Leadership, another good book. Pretty well-known guy when it comes down to the topic of persuasion, leadership, all these things. He explains this six types of bosses. First one he says is a visionary, which is very inspiring, but then empathetic. Second one he calls the coach, right, that is motivating and trusting. Then he calls the third type of boss affiliative, empathetic, and trusting. Fourth one is democratic which is trusting and collaborative democratic. What do you think? What do you guys think? Do you guys agree? Do you like this? Do you not like this? Getting everybody's consensus. Do you guys feel we should do this? And it's a lot of people making decisions together. Then five is commander, dictatorial and direct. He tells you what we do and we're going to go out there and he's not asking for your opinion. This is what we're doing. You go out there and do it. And number six, he calls it the pace setter. Demanding and direct, right? Demanding and direct. He sets the pace. He leads by example. These are the six ones he describes, right? Then there's Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels is an author. He's written many different books. As you can tell, this ink here, the purple one, is bleeding a little bit. So I try to do my best to explain the 10 ones he's got here. One visionary, hence both of them have a visionary. Two directional, which is kind of like the pace setter, directional. Uh, the commander, directional. They know exactly what to tell you. The next three steps are to do dot, 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 right? And then he's got strategic. They're very good at strategic. Napoleon was a strategic guy. 
some commanders, some incredible entrepreneurs, CEOs. They're very good at putting strategies together. Then you have managing. They're very good at managing a group of people. Then you have motivational, inspirational. They move you. They motivate you. get excited. They make you feel good like we can do this thing together. Then he's got the shepherding. He's very shepherd. He, he's very good at breeding people, raising people, making people be connected together. Then he's got team building, which is pretty obvious. Entrepreneurial risk taker, re-engineering. He can take something and make it even better than what it is. And I think it's bridge building, which is, you know, bringing everybody together. Hey, we can do this together. Maybe two enemies, this person knows how to bring them together and say, let's, let's collaborate. Let's do something together. So when you look at this, a lot of people will say, well, I connect more with the glorious bastard. Great. I connect with the nurturer. Phenomenal. I connect with the icon, with the coach, with the affiliative, with the strategic, with whatever. Regardless, but I got a question for you. This is the question I would always ask myself. Do you have any other peers in your life or a PE coach that also was a glorious bastard, but is just a PE coach? Do you have anybody in school or friends or family that's extremely eccentric, but they're just doing a regular small thing in their lives? How come they're not doing big things in their life? Do you have anybody in your life, you know, like maybe an uncle that's very strategic, but just got a regular job at Sears, okay? But he's very strategic. Like the things he tells you are like, this is, this, his brain is so fascinating, he's so strategic. Do you have anybody that's a nurturer? Do you have anybody that's democratic, always asking you, what do you think about this? Maybe a team leader at your job. Do you have somebody as a friend who's great at putting a team together and let's go play fantasy football? And he always knows how to get 20, 30 people to play fantasy football. But it's just a regular cat. So what may, why is it that a lot of people out there, I know you know them as well, a lot of people out there that have a little bit of all of these, but how come they're not doing something crazy? Why not? I know a lot of people that have a lot of these that no one knows about. No one knows about them. No one. You may be watching this and well, I feel I'm very eccentric. Well, how, you know, how come you haven't done something that is worthy of being written about? You may say, I don't give a shit if somebody knows about me. Well, that's fine, and you know it. But the point I'm trying to make to you is just because somebody has these doesn't make them a super boss that they end up doing incredible things in their lives. I feel what they all have in common is what I want to know is what's the common denominator. What do they all have in common? That's what I wanted to study. So I worked with a lot of people and I studied everybody. I, I, I studied their moves. I studied their answers. I would study what they would say. I studied how they responded under pressure. I studied what they would do when they get frustrated, agitated, their first answer back when you ask them a question. I studied all of those things and I realized the ones that get to the highest level, they do have a formula and a lot of commonalities amongst each other. So what is it? I got seven of them here. Let me go through them first. First one is earn moral authority. Their hands on. Let me explain to you what I mean by moral authority. You see, a lot of people want others to respect them, but they haven't gained moral authority. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. For, for instance, if I want to tell somebody how to go out there and raise money and I've never done it, I don't have moral authority, okay? Tom has worked on 15, 16 projects and he's raised $1.3 billion in his career. He has moral authority over everybody that he speaks to. He has moral authority. Somebody else could read it, but he's done it. He's got moral authority, that's respect, okay? Somebody has started a business and they've taken it from scratch with two employees, all the way up to a ton of employees and they're doing millions of dollars every year in revenues, that person has moral authority to say what it takes to go from a startup to getting to where they get to, okay? Moral authority. Sometimes a lot of people may know a lot, may be well-read or well-educated or well-communicated. They're good at communicating, but they don't have moral authority. And they get upset at somebody else who has more moral authority than them. So they secretly have to find a way to say no, they have to, you know, find a way to do a little bit more than them because they are upset that they don't have moral authority. The people that do have moral authority, they attract people. People listen to them. These icons or glorious bastard or whoever it is, they don't just have moral authority by pure luck. In a military, there was a very high level of moral authority for somebody who went to war and would constantly stay in war. Movie Gladiator, Maximus, he has moral authority. People responded to him. And the guy that played Joaquin Phoenix, he did not. Just because he's the son doesn't give you moral authority. Even Marcus Aurelius says, Maximus, you should be running this thing because of moral authority. One thing everybody has in common. Two, 
They know how to make a decision without pleasing everybody. That is a very common trait. There's a lot of people that don't know how to make decisions because every time they make a decision, they want to make sure everybody is happy. You cannot ever make the right decisions all the time expecting everybody to be happy. Sometimes you're going to need to make a decision that may not be the best decision that actually end up not being the best decision you made, but you still got to say, I made the decision because I'm the leader. I'm making a decision. And there are a lot of people in their mind, think about how many people you know, maybe even yourself, that you have something you want to do, but you're so afraid to decide because your mom's going to be happy, your dad's going to be unhappy. So because of that, you don't even decide. You may be watching and saying, I really want to do this, but if I make my decision, this friend will be happy, but this friend won't be happy, so the safest bet is to not make any decision. That's why you may be a glorious bastard, but you don't know how to make a decision. You, you may be a nurturer, but you don't know how to make a decision because you're trying to please everybody. You ain't going to get to that level where people are looking at you as somebody that's doing great things if you're always trying to make a decision that makes everybody happy. It's never going to get to that point, ever. There's never in the history of America been a president that's made all his decisions where everybody was happy. There will never be a time like that. Never. You have to accept that if you want to get to the next level. Number three, they think bigger. They think bigger. Let me explain to you what happens. It is, I mean, I, I want to say this the best way possible. It's mathematically impossible for you to keep an employee or a salesperson in your company who thinks bigger than you. It's mathematically impossible. Somebody in there has to think bigger than that person or else that person's going to get to a point where they're going to say this, I'm either going to do my own thing or I'm going to go work with somebody who thinks bigger than all of you guys. And by the way, this rubs people the wrong way. Why is that? Why is that? Here's why. I know a lot of guys who got into business for one reason. I had a guy that would work with, he would say the following. He would say, I'm secretly lazy. I'm working so hard because I'm secretly lazy. You know these slogans, I'm secretly lazy, so I'm working so hard so fast that I don't have to work anymore. But well, that's a message of a small thinker. That's not a message of a big thinker. That's a message of a small thinker. That all they want to do is the whole thing about, I'm going to make my millions of dollars because can you imagine sitting by the waterfront property home and you're drinking, you don't have to work anymore, you can wake up anytime you want and all this other stuff. To me, that's great. That person who gets there faster could be a glorious bastard, could be a nurturer, could be an affiliate boss, could be a pace setter, commander, motivational. He could be all of these. She could be all of these. But there's a level that they're only going to. It could be a million dollar year income. It's tied to money. It could be half a million dollar income, two million, three million. Who knows? It could be tied to money and then from there, boom, cruise control. I want to go off every day. They don't think that big. But they're very good communicators. By the way, let me also tell you this. This is confusing. Stay with me here. Stay with me here. The bigger thinker could be nowhere near the communicator that this other person is, but they stopped because they're happy where they're at. But the bigger thinker eventually everybody knows thinks bigger than him or anybody else. In every company, office, family, organization, church, business, everybody, you cannot hold the big thinker back. You can't. You cannot. Nothing can. Handcuffs can't. Handcuffs and shackles can't. You can't. There is something different about them, about the big thinker. You cannot do nothing to that person. They're going to keep going and getting what they want. There's a big thinker. These guys that you read about, they have that in common, and they could be complete opposite styles. Fourth one, they want it more than you. They want it more than you. Some, some of you may say, even Mario, we were talking earlier. He said, hey, what is the difference between a big thinker and wanting it more than somebody else? Okay, what is the difference between a big thinker and somebody that wants it more than another person here, right? I said, there's a big difference. He says, what is that? I said, have you ever talked to somebody who always thinks big? And they said, yeah. I said, you ever talked to somebody that says things like, man, can you imagine, you know, dude, you know, man, it'd be so cool, man, if we could build this building that is a skyscraper bigger than two World Trade Center put together and bigger than Burj Khalifa. And I can see this building being so insane. It's big and it's got slides coming from the top to the ocean. And they start talking all the time. You're like, dude, I never think like that. But that person that thinks bigger and they have a very big imagination doesn't want it that bad. They just think big. They imagine big. But they don't want it more. You could have somebody that wants to win more, but they don't yet think big. They just want to win more. They want to win more. If you have the combination of a big thinker and somebody wants it more, that's a true believer, and that's a very dangerous person right there.
because it's very hard to stop this person. You either have to kill this person, you either have to kill this person there, and if you don't kill them, they're going to keep going because you can't stop them. They're going to keep going. They're determined is what they are. And so many enemies have tried to stop a big thinker and somebody who wants it more than everybody else. It's tough to do. Right now where you're working at, I want you to think about this. Answer this question to yourself. And by the way, any questions, thoughts, comments, comment on the bottom. And if you still haven't subscribed, click on the subscribe button here and join the, uh, uh, the, uh, the what do you call it, the notification squad. So when the videos come out first, you're the one, one of the first ones to get it. Watch this here. Listen to me. Where are you working at right now? Wherever you're at what company you're at, what business you're at, what industry, and wherever you are, where you're around a group of people, maybe even your peers, your friends, your family. Think about the people you touch the most. I want you to answer this question. Which one of your friends thinks the biggest who also wants it the most? Who? Who? Not language. Who wants it the most? Who thinks the biggest? Some of you are watching this. You could say, me. Do the numbers reflect it? Does your performance reflect it? Does how you work today reflect it? Does your work ethic of last week reflect it? Does your discipline reflect it? So don't just be cocky and say me. I'm really asking you the question. Who is it? You know exactly who it is. It could be you. I'm not saying it's not you. But who is it? That's the person. That's the person that eventually ends up being at the top. Because you can't teach that to somebody. That's got to come from here, baby. That's here and here. You can't teach that to anybody. So point number five. They don't need all the credit. Let me explain to you what I mean by they don't need all the credit. So I want you to think about the boss you work for, the entrepreneur, the CEO, partner, somebody that's ahead of you that you have to report to. Everybody's got somebody. I got them as well. Whether mine are investors or CEOs of bigger insurance company that I'm working with, no matter what it is, no matter how big you are, everyone's got somebody that they're reporting to, including Bill Gates. Everybody does, Okay. So I want you to think about something here. Whoever you report to, whoever your superior, your CEO, entrepreneur, whoever that person is, okay? When it comes time to getting credit for an idea or the company advancing to the next level, how much does he need the credit over you? Let's just say you came up with the idea. How much does he or she need the credit over you? Does he have a trend of giving the credit out to everybody else? He doesn't need it. I want you to think about it. Now keep this in mind. There isn't anybody that wants 100% like, no, I don't care about any of the credit. Nobody's there. If somebody's there that they don't need any of the credit, they typically don't think that big, and they typically don't want it that bad. But it can't be where the thermometer is more towards 60% of them wanting all the credit. Healthy place, 20% where they need credit. 80%, everybody else's credit. Where's the thermometer of that person as well as yours? You've got to ask that question. Because the reason why a person who thinks the biggest who wants it more than anybody else doesn't need the credit is this reason. A lot of people ask and say, how is that even possible, Pat? Of course they want all the credit in the world. No, they don't. Let me explain why. Let me explain why. If you always need the credit, if you always need the credit, you know who you cannot attract? People who are better than you. You cannot attract them. How is that possible, Pat? What do you mean by that? Because if somebody comes who's a professional at what they do, and they make whatever you're doing better, you got to give them credit because they got to feel good about what they're doing with their work because if they don't, they're going to go to another place to make sure that their talents and their abilities are getting the right amount of credit. So you can't be a person that has to get the credit for everything. You got to give credit away as well. They typically have a good uh, uh, balance of the amount of credit they need versus the credit they give away to somebody else as well. That's point number five. Number six, touch of madness. All of them are a little bit weird. They're all a little bit off. I don't know a single person uh, that um, isn't a little bit crazier than the rest. Whoever that goes at the higher level, there's always a little bit of touch of madness. Uh, there's two books I highly recommend on that. One is Hypomanic Edge, and the other book is First Rate Madness. There is a little bit of madness about them. When you read First Rate Madness or Hypomanic Edge, you're going to sit there and you're going to say, I never thought about it this way before. If there isn't a touch of madness, there isn't that level to want to wanna go... You won't feel how bad they want to win. You will feel how bad they want to win if there is a touch of madness. If there's a touch of madness and everyone's got a little bit of it. Number seven, keep their word. They keep their word. What do I mean by they keep their word? Well, look, they want moral authority. And you ain't going to get moral authority if you don't keep your word. It's simple as that. You can be the most talented person in the world. You can be the most talented communicator, most talented person in the world. But if you don't keep your word, eventually, you can lie, I was sick, I was not feeling good, I had a, 
you know, heart problem. I had a heart murmur. I had this one guy work with every other month. He had a heart attack and 17 of his grandmothers died. I'm like, every single time, I'm like, dude, aren't you only supposed to have two grandmothers? No, but this is a different grandmother and this is a different this. And he, this guy was a boss to me. He was my boss. But there was always a heart problem and a grandmother or relative that passed away. Always. So eventually I'm like, listen, I didn't even ask any more favors or requests from him because there was always a crisis in his life to make up for an excuse. And then eventually I would ask other people if they felt the same way. Everybody else said, yeah, listen, I don't ask anymore because there's always something going on. We just kind of leave him alone, let him use his talents from stage. He's good. But when you work with him closely, he BSs way too much because he doesn't know how to keep his word. So as you look at all these different personality types and leadership style books, for you to read it and say, oh, I feel like that's me, man. I'm going to be so big because I'm absolutely a nurturer. I'm absolutely a coach. I am definitely such and such. That doesn't guarantee that you have already earned your moral authority because you're hands-on. That doesn't guarantee that you know how to make a decision without being afraid of pleasing everybody. That doesn't guarantee that you know how to, you think bigger than everybody else around you. That doesn't guarantee you want it more than the rest of the people. That doesn't guarantee that you don't need all the credit. That doesn't guarantee that you don't have a touch of madness. And that doesn't guarantee that you keep your word. It doesn't. This is what makes up for leaders here that you read about that get to the highest level where the world, companies, investors, people count on them to make the bigger decisions in life. Again, you got any questions, thoughts, comments, comment on the bottom. And if you haven't subscribed, click on the subscribe button. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.